thanks everyone for putting up with us getting started. My name is Karen Rucker, and this is the introduction to Antenna Basics course with Hackaday U. Thank you all for attending. And this is going to be week one, sort of an introduction to RF4 antennas. So I know we have a wide variety of students in the class, everyone from very seasoned amateur radio operators and people getting PhDs to people with no technical background whatsoever. So I'm going to try to cater uh, to that breadth as much as possible. I currently work as a satellite or a spacecraft telecom engineer, and my background is in antenna design. I have an amateur radio license myself, so I've done some hobbyist tinkering around, uh, but primarily this is going to be just an introduction to what you might encounter your first year as an antenna design engineer. So let's get started. Okay, so the week one class outline roughly is going to start very basic and some of the topics that we'll be referencing in the future. So what's an antenna? That's probably maybe important to start with an antenna class with. I would be remiss if I didn't give a very brief overview over Maxwell equations going into electromagnetic waves, talking a little bit about polarization, gain, radiation patterns. And then I'm very briefly gonna to touch on VISWAR or VSWR for this class and impedance matching and frequency bands. So first off, what's an antenna? Besides something that can occasionally look like a funnel, right? So an antenna is just a transducer that converts energy from one domain into some other domain. Right, And a transducer is just a fancy word for an electronic device that converts energy. A microphone is a transducer, right? So what an antenna does is either converts a guided electromagnetic wave that's in a waveguide or in a coaxial cable into a propagating wave in free space if it's transmitting or vice versa if you're receiving, right? So it's just sort of a transfer function to get you from one domain to the other. And generally we want a good electrical match at the antenna terminals and we want a good power transfer, right? We want it to be efficient so that we're not having loss. And loss is a huge issue when you're working in RF or radio frequency and antennas, right? Because often you're transmitting or trying to receive over long distances and you're losing power. So we wanna offset that by having an efficient system or as much so as possible, as much as reasonable for what you're doing, right? And again, I know that this can cover the gamma, gamut from uh, hobbyists that are kind of looking into playing with an antenna, or this might give you some more information for working with antennas professionally. So you're going to have different frames of reference for whatever you're doing. And I'll try to give a shout out to that because I know again, that there's a wide breadth of people in the class. So some important antenna properties, they can generally be classed into two divisions, right? We have our radiation properties and then we have our impedance properties. Radiation properties are going to be things like reciprocity. The reciprocity theorem is essentially just that you can use an antenna for transmit and receive, and that's important to know. In this class today, I'll be discussing the antenna pattern, gain, and polarization. As far as impedance properties, things like radiation resistance and loss resistance, if you're doing uh, pure antenna design, taking it as a class or doing it professionally, you're going to know and learn how to derive those and evaluate those in your system. I won't be covering those as much in class today. I will touch on voltage standing wave ratio or VISWAR. In this class, as a side note, some people have very strong opinions as to whether you say VSWR or VISWAR, because engineers like to make arbitrary distinctions about things that don't matter sometimes. It's just a cultural difference. They mean the same thing, right? 
So um, I know some people like to tease a little bit, but wherever you're with culturally, however they do it is fine. So first let's talk about isotropic antennas. And so what does an isotropic antenna have in common with a pink llama unicorn under a rainbow? They're the same thing, they don't exist, right? So an isotropic antenna is this hypothetical antenna that has perfect same radiation in all directions in a perfect sphere, right? And this is something that some students struggle with understanding because you might think that you want your antenna to be as close to isotropic as possible, or that this should be something that you strive for in your design. And that's not actually true, right? The isotropic antenna is just a mathematical construct that we use as a frame of reference because frames of reference are important in physics. Um, it you know, has a gain of one dB or one decibel in this spherical space, and it has a perfect efficiency of 100%. And I'll talk a little bit more about gain, decibels, and efficiency here later. But the reason that I'm bringing this up right now is because when we talk about our antenna performance, antennas in real life, we generally specify gain in dBi, or decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. So all that is is a ratio that we're giving in reference to this idealized mathematical construct. So that's all you really need to know about it is just that it's a frame of reference that we use for our um, antenna design. Going briefly into Maxwell equations, if you have a background in electrical engineering, this is something that you were taught uh, professionally. And if you don't have that background, that's perfectly fine. Um, the most important uh, one that will lead into our next slide is the last one, right? But what you need to know is that there are four Maxwell equations. We have Gauss's law, which is just a relationship between a static electric field and the electric charges that cause it. We have that same Gauss's law, but for magnetism, meaning that there's no individual magnetic charges um, or magnetic monopoles. It's always in a dipole form. We have Faraday's law, which is that a time varying magnetic field creates or induces an electric field. And that's very important for what we're about to talk about. And then we have Ampere's law that has Maxwell's addition. And that's magnetic fields can be generated in two ways, by electric current and by changing electric fields. So those last two are gonna lead into how we get an electromagnetic wave. And that's why I really wanted to cover them. If you're going to learn antennas, uh, antenna design through a course or uh, take advanced coursework in it, you're definitely gonna want to know these. And you're also gonna want to know how to derive these into the electromagnetic wave equation, right? But that's very mathematical and that's not something that I'm gonna be covering here today. I really just wanted to reference that the electromagnetic wave comes from these last two laws, Faraday's law and Ampere's law with Maxwell's addition. And on the right, if that looks like hieroglyphics to you, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you're going to be doing antennas professionally, or going into higher level coursework, you're going to want to understand the vector calculus and vector operators that go into these equations very much. But if you're just learning for fun, then you're absolutely okay not paying attention to that. So going into what an electromagnetic wave is, as we talked about from those previous two uh, Maxwell equations, the electromagnetic waves are composed of these oscillating magnetic and electric fields that are induced from each other, right? So you have your magnetic field, which is generally kind of denoted as a B vector, and you have your electric field denoted as your E vector. And these propagate in an orthogonal direction. Orthogonal is just a fancy word for 90 degrees. It's really fun to drop into everyday conversation, but you have your magnetic field, your electric field, and your direction of propagation, 
And here's what that looks like in GIF form, right? We have these time varying oscillating waves and that is our construct of how this moves through space. And the reason I'm starting at such a base level with what an electromagnetic wave is that this is important to understand what polarization is, right? Which is important for your antenna design. So note that the magnetic wave vector is moving in the Z and X plane and the electric field vector is moving in that um, Y, X plane, right? Again, orthogonal to each other and orthogonal to the direction of propagation. And so the electromagnetic spectrum spans a really wide range, right? And some of the important things to know about this are that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional, right? The larger your wavelength, the smaller your frequency is going to um, B. And you have different general uses for different frequency bands. I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the class. But generally what we're going to concentrate here are radio waves and primarily in microwaves, which is the higher end of RF that I work in, right? But one of the cool things about the electromagnetic spectrum is that it's all the same spectrum, right? Um, I have a friend, Tess, who uh, tweeted something uh, super funny today that light is just spicy radio waves, right? Um, and it was very clever and it's all the same spectrum, but they all behave differently kind of depending on whether or not they're going through the atmosphere, whether or not they're bouncing or reflecting off surfaces. Um, but it's a good idea to have in mind not only what frequency, you have to know what frequency you're designing for, but also kind of what the different unique uh, parameters are of that frequency, right? Because of your wavelength size. And you should generally know about the size of your wavelength, right? Whenever you're designing with your frequency, right? You should have a good understanding of those and the relationship with each other. So here's that same GIF again. And again, the reason that I said I wanted to bring this up is polarization. And polarization is really just how the electric field vector moves. And if this were going into a sheet of paper, what it traces out, what shape it traces out, right? So again, we talked about the electric field and the magnetic fields vectors being orthogonal. And a lot of times, uh, not in this depiction, you'll see the K as being the direction of propagation. That's where your wave is going, right? And the reason this is important to understand is because there are so many different kinds of polarization. And because of that reciprocity theorem, we want our transmitting antenna and our receiving antenna to have match polarization or else you're going to have a mismatch, a polarization mismatch, which leads to loss. So we have linear polarizations such as horizontal and vertical. And um, you might see those in antennas like uh, dipoles or yagis. And uh, something that was new to me that I just recently learned was slant polarization, which is also linear. It's often used in radar systems. And then we have circular polarization, such as right-hand circular or left-hand uh, circular polarization, which is a clockwise rotation and elliptical. So I know that was a lot of words thrown out but let's look at linear polarization, right? Horizontal and vertical. So if we go back to that previous slide, remember that we said polarization is just the pattern traced by that E field vector, right? So here the E field is moving up and down. So what polarization is that? It's linear and it's vertical, right? So that's all it is. That's all that this is saying is that your E field is moving 
like this in this direction. And one of the reasons that's important when I talked about mismatch loss, you can kind of imagine if you have an electric field vector, electric wave that is vertically polarized coming like this. And because of reciprocity, we want it to be the same, but if it's meeting a horizontally polarized wave, there's not a lot of match between my arm that's held vertically and my arm that's held horizontally, right? What we would want for a perfect match is for both of those to be the same. We want it to be one-to-one. -one. If you are transmitting with a vertically polarized antenna into a horizontally polarized antenna, you're going to have so much loss that you're probably not gonna get the signal, depending on how far away again, how far away you are and how much gain you have. But what you want, the reason that you need to know this is because you want your antennas to have the same polarization. So in here on the right is a depiction of circular polarization. And circular polarization is, it can be a little uh, bit harder or more steps to design for, but it's frequently used in space applications, particularly ground to space and space to ground, because you don't have to worry as much about perfectly lining something up right? Think about it when you're however many hundreds or even millions of kilometers away, it might be hard to get a one-to-one -one match if you were vertically polarized. So the circular polarization can be a lot more forgiving uh, in those situations. And you can make several antennas that are linear into circular polarization depending on how you design them. Um, for example, you can make this horn antenna circularly polarized by simply having two ports feeding into it that are 90 degrees apart. And you can do the same thing with like a Yagi antenna that is, like I said, regularly linearly polarized, okay? So the important thing from these slides is that you want to intentionally design for your antenna's polarization to match wherever you're trying to transmit or receive from. So now I wanna talk a little bit about gain. Briefly mentioned it before. So antenna gain is just the power at the antenna terminals and it includes antenna losses. When you are studying antennas, uh, in an electrical engineering curriculum, they're first gonna introduce the concept of directivity to you, right? And occasionally as an antenna design engineer, you might need to know directivity or you might need to plot it in a uh, computer model or system. But generally for practical applications, we refer to gain because gain includes the efficiency of the antenna and it's not this idealized number, right? We want to include all the losses that are already in the antenna itself, because that's the number that we're really gonna use to get from one point to another. And I mentioned previously uh, that you need your gain to satisfy your link budget. And a link budget is just a simple sum and subtraction total of all your losses and all your gains in the system. If you have a number of your gain from your antenna and your transmitter, then you have your loss that occurs over the free space. And then if you have another gain and gain in your receiver, and then maybe some loss from some cable, you just want all that mathematically to add up that you can get to where you need to go, right? And one of the things about gain that I frequently see in student rocketry projects is when they're building their ground system to connect to their uh, rocket, they want lots of gain because initially when you're first getting into antenna design, you think I want all the gain possible. That's the most important thing. Gain tends to be a trade-off with your radiation pattern. And so you don't always need the most gain possible unless you're doing like a contest and you're trying to get the most gain 
uh, and I know they have those for amateur radio uh, conferences and such, but you really have to consider the other things that your antenna has to satisfy besides just gain, right? And again, this is typically given in DBI or decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. Um, and so you'll see that pretty frequently. There are other uh, units that are sometimes used with antennas such as DBIC, decibels relative to an isotropic circularly polarized antenna. But generally speaking, you're mostly gonna see uh, DBI. So going into radiation patterns, you want to design or pick an antenna design that satisfies the radiation pattern that you need, right? And so on the right, we have a very directional radiation pattern. And the main part of the beam that's gonna come out is called the main lobe. You might have a back lobe depending on what kind of antenna you're using, and you might have side lobes. So this is on the right, a very directional antenna gain pattern, right? And so it's going to be a high gain. It's very focused. And you might see this from something similar to like a Yagi antenna, right? But remember when I talked earlier about some mistakes that some students have made in uh, their ground systems for having telemetry with their rockets, they would choose a very high gain, you know, Yagi antenna, maybe something with 13 to 20 elements, you know, that's gonna give you a lot of gain and it's gonna have a very, very focused beam. The problem is that launching your rocket, especially your own rocket is really exciting, right? Um, especially when you're there on the team and uh, everyone's celebrating. And so you have a student who's holding the antenna and they go to cheer with the team and they turn. And with them turns the antenna if it's handheld. And they've then lost the signal from, the, from their rocket's telemetry and then they can't find it. Um, and I, I point this out because it's happened often enough times that I have to warn about it in one of the projects where I'm a judge. And so it's a cautionary tale of absolutely having the highest gain is a, not always suitable for the rest of your system requirements, right? It might be easier to have something that has a little bit of a broader radiation pattern like on the left. And B, it might not be worth the extra expense either if you're buying an antenna or the expense of your own time and energy and materials of trying to tune an antenna to get a lot of gain. So it is certainly important and it's a fundamental need to close a link, but it's not always the end all be all when we're designing an antenna for our systems needs, right? So I'm gonna briefly touch on this war in this course. I'll talk about it a little bit more in the next course, which goes over testing for antennas but this is going to lead into impedance matching, which is important. So typically there are two ways that we talk about having a good impedance match for an antenna, right? So we have a visoir, also known as SWR, and we have meters that can measure that ratio of transmitted to reflected energy, right? And we want to have that be as close to one to one as possible. And the lowest it can be is one, and it can go up to infinity. And if your visoir is infinity, you have a really bad antenna, right? But it's always positive. Um, and again, that's the ratio of transmitted to reflected energy. And if you think about it, what do we want that ratio to be, right? We want everything to be transmitted and we don't want anything to be reflected back to us, right? We want for maximum power transfer for everything to go through, through this port out instead of being reflected back into the rest of our system, right? I've seen uh, this wire used more often in RF projects in the amateur community. As a professional design engineer, what I was more familiar with and what was uh, culturally more common 
was the parameter of return loss, which is sort of the same thing, but not exactly, right? And we'll go into network theory a little bit more in the next class. But what you need to know for here is that return loss is also known as S11, which is how much power is reflected at point one um, that was transmitted in 2.1, right? And because this is NDB on the right and negative, this varies from zero to negative infinity. So if you're used to one of these parameters or one of these types of measurement, the other one might look a little odd to you because one is always positive and one should always be negative. If you are getting a return loss or S11 of a positive number, something is wrong, something is broken, right? But it's really generally just kind of culturally what might happen in your team or your organization or what you're comfortable with, right? And there are, as you can see on the screen from the Viswar equation, there's ways to uh, convert from one to another. But again, the whole point is that we want power, any power that's incident or transmitted through this antenna, we want it to go through. We don't want it reflected back, right? Because then it's going back into the rest of your system instead of going out where we want it to go. So I talked about impedance matching. So one of the prereqs for this course was some basic network theory and circuit theory. And that's just because I didn't want to have to derive Ohm's law or anything like that. But impedance is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's the amount of opposition in a circuit, right? And if you are familiar with this, you will know that impedance has both a real component, which is the resistance, and it has an imaginary component. Um, if you're not familiar with that, don't worry about the fact that it's imaginary, but it's a reactance that can be either inductive or capacitive, right? So inductive, that's for an inductor, a passive component, or capacitive from a capacitor. And each of those has their own unique relationship with how they relate to current or voltage. And the reason that you need to know this, at least generally, is because of impedance matching. So what happens if I didn't start off with a perfect match from the impedance at this antenna terminal to whatever cable or waveguide that I wanna hook it up to, right? Well, then I have to do some matching in between the two. And all you're doing is introducing something, a stopgap of a sort that can help match those impedances between those two um, systems, right? This can be done through a ballon, can be done through introducing a capacitor or an inductor. But the point of impedance matching is again, we wanna maximize that power transfer, right? And we wanna minimize any signal reflection from the load or from this antenna, right? We want everything to go through. So just know that you might have to do a little bit of tuning with whatever antenna that you ultimately design. And people have to do this um, even professionally, right? So it really should be expected. It's not a sign that you were a terrible engineer if you have to do some impedance matching, either because you designed it slightly off from what you needed to be, or in some cases, you might need to match something that is 50 ohms to a you know 300 ohm line. And that's just the basic properties of the materials that you're working with, right? And how close you get this impedance match really depends on whatever requirements you're going for. Um, as we talked about in this previous slide, it talks about having the ratio be as close to one to one as possible. And ideally you would have a perfect match, right? Um, but 
that's not always feasible, even in industry, right? And this is going to depend on what kind of system you're working with. For example, if you are working with space components or anything that's going on a spacecraft, you want it to be well matched, right? Uh, requirements or offerings for antennas for uh, the space industry can be, you know, one to 1.1 or one to 1.2. That's how close the standing wave ratio match is, right? But if you're just goofing around, it might be, you know, uh, a visoire four, you know, something that you would normally not even think would even work, right? But you can have a perfectly matched dummy load, something that doesn't radiate at all, where the signal just goes in and is terminated. Or you can have a terribly matched antenna that is otherwise a perfectly good antenna. So something to keep in mind is that you don't always have to aim for perfection if you're doing this for hobbyist reasons. You really just want to get the most that you can reasonably that's gonna satisfy the requirements of your system, right? And so on this class, I'm going to focus more with the exception of the Yogi's that will be kind of in the very high frequency range or VHF. Um, this class will probably primarily focus on microwave frequency bands simply because that's what I have experience with. And so you'll commonly see these uh, referred to by their letter designations on the left. And you should generally know uh, if you're working in this domain, what frequency range that matches up to. And so for some examples, L band, that's where GPS frequency is. Uh, S band, S as in Sierra, and X as in X-ray bands are used uh, frequently for telemetry tracking and control operations in the space industry from space to ground and vice versa. Uh, some of the upper bands such as K, KA, and V bands are often used for downlinking science data from space and you know, various other applications. Uh, X-band also has uh, marine navigational radar that's commonly used in that band. One thing of note, the letters aren't in alphabetical order. I've been asked that before. They have various like historical meanings. Uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia if you're interested in just knowing that kind of thing. Um, but for example, X-band was because of, I think, radar and um, because it was introduced in, I think World War II, it was X marks the spot. That's where they came up with that de declaration. And from KU, K and KA band, KU is K under, under K band. And uh, KA, I think it has like a German uh, background, but it means like K after. So you don't need to know that, um, but I know some people get confused because it's just alphabet gobbledygook and that part doesn't matter, right? Um, if you're working professionally in these bands, you'll wanna know what they are, what they mean as far as your frequency range and kind of what to expect in your wavelength range. And almost all antenna design that I've seen through university curriculum is always in metric units. They'll give wavelength range in meters or centimeters and that's easy, right, when you're converting uh, between uh, wavelength and frequency because you're gonna use the speed of light um, as you know, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, right? Because all radio waves propagate at the speed of light. However, if you're in American industry, um, they will actually frequently use um, imperial units, right, uh, in inches. So that was a big surprise to me and something that you might be prepared for if you're going to work for American industry. And if you are outside of American industry, but still having to work with us, you'll probably have to deal with our requests to have things in Imperial units. So just pre be prepared for that. 
and my deepest apologies. So, and this is one of the last slides that I wanted to go over. We should have plenty of time for questions. We have, there's a wide range of applications and frequency bands for RF, right? And this can go from huge, huge wavelengths that are used, um, particularly I think in HF or high frequency, uh, they will often use to study ionospheric effects, uh, particularly down at Antarctica. But what these acronyms mean is VLF is very low frequency, low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency, because back in the day when they came up with that de designation, they thought, um, you know, that was high frequency. And now we're doing optical communications, right, with spacecraft, which is extremely high frequency. Um, but this kind of shows uh, different bands and what they might be used for. I know that amateur radio tends to be a little less popular in the microwave bands, but that's primarily where your satellite and microwave uh, telecom is going to be. Um, that's where, uh, so this horn antenna that I keep holding up is an X-band horn from 10 to 12 gigs. And we'll talk about that in one of the later classes, I think on the microwave antenna application. Uh, the Yagis that I'm most familiar with that I'll cover in one of the classes are VHF and also UHF right around there. Um, but again, here's those microwave frequency bands that I kind of just went over, L, S, C, X, K, U, K, and K, A, and those are generally how they're uh, said, K, A instead of K. A. And uh, this graphic here has them as satellite frequency, but that's just the denotion in the graphic. You can have those same bands on different stuff here on Earth, for example, radars and other kinds of things like that. So one of the last things that I'll mention briefly is I've talked a lot about dB, which is the measurement for RF. And again, as I stated before, dBi is decibels relative to an isotropic antenna that we use to measure gain in antennas with, but it's just a change in power, right? And the key thing to remember is that the dB value is a relative unit, right? It's a relationship of power out to power in. So you always have something that it's in relation to when you're strictly talking in dB. But when you have things like dBm, that's an absolute power that's gonna be measured relative to one milliwatt because it has that very absolute power reference. And the equation for dB is 10 log, because we are relating it to the power. And I know some people get confused over when to use 10 log or 20 log. And the difference is whether or not you are relating to power or to voltage. And that comes from Ohm's law, right? Whether or not we have that squared. But the key thing to remember is that it's 10 uh, log 10, it's not natural log, is how we measure dB. I have in my slides some additional resources of things that have helped me along the way of both kind of putting some of these slides together and trying to organize them in a reasonable fashion and things I also use my first year as an antenna design engineer. Everything RF also has some good calculators of going in between wavelength and frequency, or, you know, VISWAR to S11. And all those things, ideally, you should know how to do either by hand or from scratch. But as a professional engineer, you're just gonna plug it into a calculator, generally speaking, um, even though that's not how they teach you in class. But 
these are some of the ones that I've had a good experience with. And as I briefly mentioned in the next class, I'm gonna talk about intended testing. So I'll go over a little bit more of the BISWAR network analyzers and S parameters I mentioned here. There are more S parameters than just S11, right? And I'll also talk about the FAR field. And so my thinking was to give kind of a very basic background in this first class and then look at testing so that as soon as we go into design that you could have the background and have the testing knowledge to dive right in. But that's planned for next class. Uh, thank you so much for attending and I'm really excited to have our next class and I'll see y'all in a week.